Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm Professor Rios, and welcome to the first lesson of Geo 102, Human Geography. This is an update uh, to a lesson that a lesson video that had been there for a while. So, just some updates, some cleanup, and um, so we'll get going. This is not administrative in nature, so if you have administrative type questions or concerns, refer to the course guide and syllabus. On Byte Space, uh, refer to the welcome video or the administrative module on Bright Space, whatever works. If you still have any questions after that, simply email me and or contact me via the information provided in the contact module inside of Bright Space. So having said all that. Let's get going. So I'm gonna bring up the lesson and I'm gonna bring up Google Earth just as a little bit of a reminder. And let me minimize this. Google Earth, while it is not really part of this lesson, I bring it up simply because it is week one. There's a, you should use it. You should take advantage of this tool, which is free, available simply of, uh, on Google Chrome and Firefox. Those are the only two browsers, but it is free. There is no account to get, there is no password to remember, there is no money to give them. It's a free tool that you can use in order to sort of do all kinds of good stuff with it. So, um, I'm going to link a video that I have my Geo 101 course look at, which might help you use this within, say, the discussions in Geo 102. And that's sort of where I'm trying to go with this. You should use Google Earth. It doesn't have to be used in every discussion, but in some discussions, it might make you help make your point better. Again, it may not apply to every single discussion, but it would apply to some throughout the semester. So take advantage of it. You know, use it. It's there for a reason. It's free. It's relatively easy to use. And please don't confuse it with Google Maps because it isn't. So enough on that. Again, there will be a link to the Geo 101, which is physical geography, but I think you'll get the idea of how and why it could be useful to you. We'll get going. I'm gonna put this in presentation mode and get it started. So Geo 102, Human Geography. Here's my contact info. Office is online via email, office hours. Again, there is a live office hour feature on Brightspace using Zoom. And there's my email address. There's also a couple of other emails that I provide and my Google voice number. And that's all available on Brightspace. Here's what the textbook looks like. Again, we've sort of gone over this in the welcome video. And again, human geography. So, you know, as an old boss of mine used to say, because places matter. Mat they matter in a sense of why you go where you go, why do you live where you live in an ever-changing job market? Why are people moving to places like Tennessee and Texas and Arizona? What's happening? Um, what's the changing work landscape doing to people's sort of geographical or mental map? It's changing and it's changing really fast. This all precedes COVID too. COVID may have made it more... I guess, pressing. Uh, so this is sort of happening, and it's happening not just in the United States, obviously. It's happening worldwide. As things like artificial intelligence become more and more um, pervasive, the usage of some of those things, um, the job market's changing, and it changes, and it usually has a geographical footprint. And again, places do matter. Uh, I think about all the empty office space in New York City right now, for example, and there's lots of discussions from people. What are they going to do with that space? Are they going to convert it? Is, you can't just turn it into housing because office buildings are built differently. So it's not like there were, you know, in, in living space, you need bathrooms in every single unit. That's not the case in a work building. So 
lots and lots of changes have happened. Lots and lots of changes are about to happen. So stay tuned. Now, again, what is geography? It's description of the earth. Okay, that's one. It is a spatial science, spatial implying location. And it is mostly a study of spatial variation. So how things change with within a particular geographic footprint, like religion, language, culture, just to mention three of them. Uh, geography is both a natural and a social science that examines not only spatial occurrences, there is that word again, but the distributions and the interrelationships of people and environment. So, you know, natural is more like physical geography, climate, geology, geomorphology, whereas social science implies culture, people, population. Uh, and so oftentimes some things are affected by both social components and natural ones. And that's where geography kind of comes in to help explain some of that. Uh, the focus, of course, you know, there's regional geography, which is very specific. You know, you go section to section, like, for example, North America, Europe, East Asia, South Asia. Um, that's focusing on one area. Systematic geography is sort of breaking it down into the physical component of it and the human component of it. And so in this course, we're going to focus obviously on the second one, the human component of that. There's a separate course, Geo 101, Physical Geography, if you choose or need to take another course at some point. Just a little advertising there for you. Uh, focus of geography, again, you know, think about the idea of spatial systems, that second uh, bullet there, the link between physical phenomenon and human activities in an area. So think about when hurricanes hit an area, right? Florida, Texas, New York, North Carolina. Um, and of course, it affects the coastline most severely, but it also affects areas inland because gas runs out, electricity's out, supply lines get interrupted, things run out, and it really affects people. And so that effect sort of spreads with time and, of course, space. Uh, here's a good way to look at data. And this is a really old map, as you can see there in the lower right. It says March 2003. But while the map may be old, it is simply a way of showing you, using maps, how geography kind of be, you, how can you, how you can see regional differences in the U.S., so, for example, in our part of the Northeast, we called a Coke or a Pepsi or Diet Dr. Pepper or whatever, you call it a soda. But if you head far enough west, even in western New York and the Midwest, you call it, or they tend to call it, pop. And if you're in the south, in Georgia, headquarters of Coke, Alabama, Texas, you find it that they call it Coke. What kind of Coke do you want? Even if you're referring to Mountain Dew. Uh, this is becoming less and less of a thing as people from the North migrate South, people from the West migrate East, and there's sort of a mixing going on. So in some areas, it is distinctively one or the other. But in some, like for example, in Central Texas, where you have lots of people moving there from California, or here in North Carolina and Virginia and Maryland, where you have people from the South moving in and people from the North moving South, you tend to have notice how jumbled it looks compared to, say, New Jersey or Connecticut or Maine. Uh, here's another way of looking at data. This happens to be SST, which is sea surface temperatures. So... You know, it shows you that anything in this sort of pink to maroon color is anything that is 29 degrees Celsius or higher. So, you know, this is a big deal, obviously, during hurricane season and the energy available for hurricanes to form. So what, that's one way of taking data and visualizing it in a map, making it easier to sort of understand and analyze. Religion 
is another way that you can look at data. In this case, it's just an image. But here, you if you're in Jerusalem, you have the three major religions sort of all interact with one another. You have Islam, you have Christianity, you have Judaism. And this is but one image. You could literally go around this city and take many images where you would see manifestations of all three. Human geography has subfields, so behavioral, political, economical, and so on. Uh, so inside of this wheel, it's a pretty straightforward way of thinking of it, is human geography. On the outside of it would be the non-geographical side of it. So think of it as two sides of a coin. So for example, uh, political geography, you have political science. Population geography, you just simply have demography. Demography simply looks at numbers. Population geography looks at the numbers of people and how they vary in space. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, some core geographical concepts. Of course, we're going to talk about the idea the, the, the things geographers ask. Space, place, absolute versus relative. All those kinds of things. So let's look at the idea of absolute and relative. Absolute is a physical, a physically real place with a measurable extent, meaning you could say latitude and longitude. That's absolute geography or an absolute place. You could say the corner of Broadway and 34th Street. Oh, okay. You can go there easily. You know where that is. That's absolute location. Relative location or space is perceptual to some degree and variable over time. So West Point is located 15 miles or so northwest of Manhattan. Oh, okay. So you have to think about, okay, where is Manhattan? Where is, okay, northwest from that would be roughly, okay, and you can sort of imagine it if you're really good with maps. If you're not, you just have to pull Google Maps and sort of look at it, and you can go, oh, I see, I get it, northwest of the city. Now we're talking about basically the lower Hudson Valley, where we live. So that's the idea of absolute and relative space, which basically attests to absolute and relative location. So we'll take a look at all these coming up. First of all, location. We already talked about that, the idea of specific, precise, and accepted. So Hong Kong, latitude 22, longitude 114 east. That's it. Only one place occupies that latitude. Relative location, again, is one place in relation to another. So Hong Kong is south of the Tropic of Cancer. All right. If you know where the Tropic of Cancer is, latitude 23 and a half degrees north, then you know that Hong Kong sits in the tropics. You could just say that, make that statement. Site and situation. So site is an expression of absolute location. Situation is an expression of relative location. Let's look at a couple of examples. The city of New Orleans, surrounded by water on three sides. You have the Gulf of Mexico, you have Lake Pontchartrain, and you have the Mississippi River, and here's the city. Really badly located as a function of being below sea level. So there you have the idea of Lake Pontchartrain and um, areas that were affected during Katrina in 2005 which led to this, right? And about 80% of the city of New Orleans was affected by Katrina. And because some of the levees that empty water into the river and the lake breached. So here's the idea of location, site versus, versus situation. Notice how everything in the orange is an area that is below sea level in New Orleans, but 
New Orleans was placed where it was by the French because it was the entry point into the rest of, at the, at the time, French territory, what eventually became the Louisiana Purchase. Here's another example of site, oh, New York City. So site refers to the internal aspects of a place. It influences why a place was selected to begin with. I mean, it's pretty obvious why New York was picked, right? This location. It sits right on a natural harbor. It has access to the river and access to the ocean. That's it. Pretty straightforward. That may be less of a thing now, but it was a big deal then. There you talk about New York site, where it sits. And now situation, where we're talking about the external aspects of a place, the, the, inf the influence of its growth, how it changes over time. Clearly, New York City has changed over time. All you have to do is look at a map an image of New York in 2024, 2020, 2010, 2000. You would have had two different buildings here. Uh, 1970, those two buildings would not be there because they weren't built yet. So you can see how it changes over time. New York situation, well, is fantastic. This location here grants the city or granted the city back in time, access to Montreal and to the St. Lawrence River through the Erie Canal. And that made New York a very powerful city. And why it grew so much stronger relative to places like Boston and Philadelphia and other parts of the then very young United States. But did you have direction and distance, both relative and absolute? Physical and cultural attributes, of course, the natural landscape is pretty straightforward. There is a nice image of one. But the cultural landscape is a little different. And here we're talking about the visible expression of human activity. So imagine you take a natural place, mountain, a valley, something, and then you add something that is clearly put there by humans, like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, or this Buddhist um, temple, Borobudur, in Southeast Asia, which has a very significant cultural means something significant to that culture in that particular region. Uh, when you think about religion, whether it be Mecca or Medina in Saudi Arabia or the Vatican in Italy, uh, you can think of other places in Japan or India where religion is a very, very significant part of the cultural landscape. But it doesn't even need to be that. You could simply look at the United States in the middle, like Kansas or Oklahoma, and then zoom in on Google Earth or Google Maps, and you can see all the little checkers, little checkerboards. And that checkered pattern is basically how humans have basically shaped the landscape for agriculture. That's the cultural landscape as well. Look about places. So places change. Here happens to be the Aral Sea, um, a natural salty lake in the middle of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and how it's changed. And you might wonder, well, why has it emptied? Is it climate change? And no, the answer is not climate change. Amazing, right? Something that you can't blame on climate change. This is simply because Back in the 60s and 70s, the two rivers that kept it full coming from mountains in the Western Himalayas were diverted for the cotton farming industry by the Soviets. And when you take away the water source in an area that's relatively dry, you get this. And it's basically almost entirely dry. It's been divided into two. There's a dam right here. You see that little straight line? 
So this one has remained relatively stable. This one clearly has not. And so an area that used to be much, because water is a very sort of normalizing substance when it comes to temperature. Now the places, this area, people who live here deal with hotter summers and colder winters. And this is what's happened. It's basically gone. Uh, they used to have a fishing industry, which is obviously now defunct. Also, Dubai. You know, why has it changed so much? Why? It's a function of reinvention. So they pretty much know they're running out of oil. So they've decided to become a financial banking and entertaining entertainment hub in the Middle East. It's relatively forward thinking and progressive, if you want to use that term, for this area of the world. It's still not ideal, but it's better. Anyway, this building is the tallest building in the world, and it is the tallest building in the world by quite a bit. Connectivity, whether it be fiber cable at the bottom of the oceans connecting basically different parts of the world or social media platforms. You know, social media platforms can connect the world obviously in a virtual manner. Uh, you can interact with Instagram people across the pond in Europe and South America and Asia, and they can interact with you or WhatsApp, or what used to, Facebook used to be the biggest one. This one is quickly not becoming well regarded. Um, many people your age, young people, are probably not using Facebook anymore. If you haven't, you may not have used it in years now. Uh, so, but here you see ones like WeChat and Douyin and others that are from other parts of the world. Remember, we're not the only ones that use it. TikTok, for example, is a Chinese platform. It was invented there. Um, and so just like Twitter is used by outside of the US, other platforms, TikTok, for example, is used outside of its original development location. Talk about the idea of uh, density, dispersion, and pattern. So here's an, a, a good way of looking at density and dispersion. This is a nighttime map of the Korean Peninsula, China, Japan, and you can see the lights at night. North Korea is basically empty. Not empty, dark. The only little bit of light would be the capital, Pyongyang. But just to its south, here is Seoul, South Korea, one of the most powerful cities in Asia now. I mean, think about S South Korea. You may own a Samsung Galaxy. You may drive a Kia or a Hyundai. Uh, many, many brands. You may have an LG appliance or a Samsung appliance. So very, very powerful economy immediately to the south of an economy that's basically dead in North Korea. Uh, we'll talk about formal, functional, and perceptual regions. So here's an example of formal, meaning data within a particular boundary. So this happens to be discrepancy in education. So the greener something is, the bigger the difference between male and female education levels, percent of people born in a particular state that live there, a little bit dated, 2010, but you get the point. That's formal. A functional region might be banking, meaning there are banking centers throughout the states and where they tend to have influence over their regional banking Units, banks, physical banks. I know that's less and less of a thing now, but it's, you know, there are still banks people go to every day. Deposit, take money out, put money in, 
safe deposit boxes and all that kind of stuff. Or a perceptual region of the different parts of Europe. So for example, Mediterranean Europe in the purple. Uh, and why would they be similar? Well, maybe they share a palette of food, ingredients, language, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, versus France, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands. Of course, you have the United Kingdom and Ireland on one side, Scandinavia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and the Eastern European region. So a lot of this is sort of colored by the old East-West divide, you know, Warsaw Pact, NATO countries. That's obviously changed, uh, but you have this sort of set of countries here, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, the Ukraine, these countries used to belong to not Russia, but to the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, they became independent states. Maps, the idea of map scale, the global grid using data, using maps trying to show some information. So for example, this is not the best graphic, but you get the point, latitude, longitude, that's the global grid. Latitude lines are from zero all the way to 90, north or south. They help you determine east-west distance, whereas, I'm sorry, north-south, you can, you know, the, the if you're going in this direction, you're going north. If you're going in this direction, you're headed south. Longitude lines basically meet at the poles, so from North Pole to South Pole, and they help to determine east-west distance. Here's an example of using data, <coughs> excuse me, using population, whether it be population density, population using dots or circles, so in the case of this image here, where you see the bigger circle, Los Angeles, the biggest population center, smaller circles, a million. So anything in these by these two circles represent cities that are about a million or more. So you're talking about Los Angeles, Palm Springs, San Diego, Oakland, San Francisco, Sacramento, and then smaller cities from there on out. Map scale is what you use to depict the relationship between the size on a map and size on the real world. So for example, in Google Maps or Google Earth, it's the zoom level. When you zoom in and out, you'll see the little bar at the bottom change. So that little line might represent 10 miles. Then it might represent one mile if you zoom in. And then it might represent half a mile or 50 meters or whatever the case might be. And if you zoom way out, one inch might represent 1,500 miles or whatever scale you're using, kilometers, meters, whatever. Um, so that's where map scale comes in. Here's an example of scale, not the best image, but you get the point. This is using the city of Boston. This is up close a little bit zoomed out, more zoomed out, and now here you can see the greater Boston area. GIS, you might, heard, you might have heard of this, geographic information systems. This is a way of layering data and then using that, those layers to analyze. So for example, you may layer utilities on top of land ownership on top of zones and districts on top of your basic map of roads. And you may put a terrain model on top of it. And based on that, you might make a decision as to where establish a business. Where is the best place to open a new Panera? If that's what you want to open. Where is the best place to put a mall or some shopping center? Where is the best place to put X, Y, or Z. Geographic information systems help you do this. Now, don't confuse GIS with GPS. That little blue dot that you see on your phone when you're using them, that, that's GPS. That simply tells you latitude, longitude. 
this is a way of visually taking different layers of data and layering them up in order to be able to make decisions. Mental maps, think about the idea, you have them, you use them all the time. It's your view of spatial reality. And think about the idea of where you go on a weekly basis. And if you really start to think about it, you will probably realize there are almost, there's almost like a electric fence controlling you. There's probably areas beyond which you just never go. Might be conscious, you may have no need to go in a particular direction. But for me, that would be basically Middletown. I have no need to ever go west of Middletown. Poor Jervis, Sullivan County, no need. It's almost like once I get to Middletown, that's like my fence. So my mental map points more south and southeast, New York City, New Jersey, probably because I have friends there and I know the area better. So that's sort of my mental map. And of course, east because my brother lives in Rhode Island. So as a result, travel there. Uh, the idea of spatial systems and models, a model, let's look at that, is simply a simplified abstraction of reality. So models help you to understand complicated things. You take complicated data and information and you model it in a way that's relatively simple, relatively speaking, so that you can make heads or tail of it. Like for example, a weather map is a model. It takes all this really complicated data that came from some numerical system and you put it in pretty colors. Oh, red means heavy, green means light. Oh, got it, get it, you're making sense of it. You don't need someone to explain it to you. You can just simply look at the little legend and it tells you, wow, if we, if we see red or purple, that's bad. If you see green, blue, eh, that's not too bad. That's a model, a way of looking at data in a more simplified manner. So we'll end it there. Next is chapter two, which is the roots and meaning of culture. Um, Again, I highly encourage you to use Google Maps. I'm sorry, Google Earth. Let me correct myself. Google Earth in your discussions. Um, it'll help you to make your points. It'll distinguish your submission from others, which hopefully leads to better grades. So, it's, you know, it's a subjective bit of grading. So you have to distinguish yourself from others. So it is one good way to do that. In any event, I hope you have a fantastic semester and I look forward to interacting with you. Talk to you soon. Bye.